And welcome to Chatham House. Welcome back for those of you that are regulars um, for this panel discussion, which launches what we think is a very exciting new project um, at Chatham House on democracy and technology uh, in Europe um, that's going to run over the next um, six months or so. Um, we're going to be um, exploring the impact that um, the development of digital technology um, is having uh, on democracy uh, in Europe. Um, we're going to be thinking about how um, democracy in Europe, or democracies in Europe, perhaps, perhaps I should say, um, can be um, reinvigorated and updated against the background of this technological change uh, that's happening. And finally, we're going to be thinking about um, what role technology itself can play um, in that process of reinvigorating and updating um, democracy. Um, I say it's an exciting project partly because of the issues themselves. I think it's fairly self-explanatory that these are really important, um, urgent issues um, that a lot of people are talking about um, at the moment. Um, but we're also excited about it because um, of the process. Um, we've come up with what we think is um, uh, an innovative research process, certainly for Chatham House, but I think actually for think tanks um, in general. Um, we've brought together 15 um, leading figures uh, from around Europe, and we have three of them um, on the panel uh, today, Francesca, Julia, and Guillaume. Um, as I say, from different backgrounds, different parts of Europe, hopefully with very different perspectives, um, and their role is going to be to um, lead and steer this um, research process. But to complement that, um, commission model, um, we've developed what we think is an innovative, much more open online research process um, where we're encouraging other people to take part, to contribute their ideas, not just as submissions in the way that commissions often have worked in the past, but actually then in, a, in another phase of the process to actually take part in discussions through our website and actually begin to um, shape the ideas that will make their way into um, the, the final research report, which we're hoping to launch in September. So we very much hope that um, some of you will take part in that part of the process as well and contribute your ideas um, to the project. Um, there'll also be a series of panel discussions. This is very much the first um, in a series of events we'll be having at Chatham House on different aspects of the relationship between democracy and technology uh, in Europe. Um, and there'll be other members of the Commission taking part um, in some of those. So we hope to see you um, at some of those uh, events uh, as well. Um, is technology destroying democracy? If we, were to have, if we were to have had this discussion about the relationship between democracy and technology, let's say, seven or eight years ago, um, I think we might have phrased the question in a much more optimistic kind of way. Um, something like, um, is technology going to liberate uh, humanity? Um, is the technology going to democratize uh, the world? We seem to have gone in that space of time from a very optimistic view about the role of, of, of technology in relation to democracy to a very pessimistic view, almost in a kind of manic, depressive uh, mood swing, it seems to me. Um, what we're going to try to do on the panel today is bring some nuance to that. Um, I'm guessing that all of our panelists, all of whom use technology, work with technology in different ways, I'm assuming that none of them is going to give a very, very straightforward um, yes um, to that uh, question that we've set. Um, but I'm hoping also that the answers are going to be very different from each other and we'll have a little bit of discussion amongst ourselves. And then I want to open it up um, as soon as possible for you to comment and, and, and ask questions uh, as well. Um, why don't we start with you, Francesca? Um, let me just put that question very simply to you. Is technology destroying democracy? Um, first of all, great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And I think it's uh, absolutely crucial and urgent to have this conversation and to forge alliances to, uh, to look at the path forward. So I think we were discussing just before the panel that it would be very nice if someone just replied yes. And so we can get the conversation started. Uh, but I think it's a bit more complex than that. So obviously, um, say a binary answer, it's not what we're looking uh, for. I think, first of all, uh, we have to start understanding, and I think we are getting there, that when we talk about technology, it's not a technocratic um, topic. It is not about technology only. It is about how technology is shaping the socioeconomic system that we live in, and it has very strong implication in 
how we shape governments, the geopolitics, and the future economic system. And obviously, democracy is part of that. So um, we are definitely in urge to revitalize democracy. And also, uh, we observe, so I'm a chief technology officer in Barcelona. And, uh, and we work at a local level in a city. And what we observe very strongly is uh, this very strong lack of trust uh, of political institution uh, from citizens at large. And many citizens, let's say, have lost hopes in the political system, but also in the broadly in the financial system and in the corporate world. So many people just don't expect the answer and don't expect a political institution to be solving the problems that they really care about. And I think we need uh, to avoid this situation where part of this lack of trust is also a crisis of political representation, uh, the crisis of parliaments, political parties, and democratic institutions. And so what we are doing uh, to give an alternative answer that is not what we are seeing more and more across the world, which is the, right of, the rise of right-wing nationalisms and people feeling disenfranchised or falling off and start voting uh, right-wing parties populists that are rising to power. We are trying to provide a different answer to this lack of trust and disenfranchisement, which is a genuinely participatory democracy. So I think that uh, basically the answer to this um, crisis shouldn't be the political system uh, to become um, less open, less transparent, and to uh, and corrupt, because this is why also lots of people were protesting, but it's basically to try and shape a different form of democracy that put really people at the center. And that's why probably I believe that cities are a great place to start, because cities are the place where people live in, where they have tangible problems, affordable housing, uh, the fight against climate change, sustainable mobility, the future of jobs, uh, uh, energy transition, it really affects how the people live. And this is a place where we can be closer to the citizens and experiment new forms of democratic participation. Just maybe to end this like a first intervention, I think technology is a crucial part there. Uh, and um, obviously, there are lots of things that are not working uh, with the extreme social and market and economic power that the tech sector is acquiring, in particular in the last years. And this uh, concentration, maybe unparalleled concentration of power, obviously posing, is posing a lot of challenges. That's why we hear a lot about the tech lash. That's why uh, we have. Um, lots of pressures for the tech companies when it comes to uh, taxation, when it comes to international trade, uh, when it comes to data, leak data leaks and <laughs> privacy, and also the rules of democracy as such. And so I believe that there is a lot of changes that need to happen there. But in particular, for instance, in Barcelona, we are proposing um, different forms of a platform for democratic participation. Let me just say that digital democracy doesn't exist, it's a myth, so it's never only digital. A Facebook democracy doesn't exist, it is a problem. So we need to always mix, we need hybrids that are hybrids between, I think, um, a representative democracy and more elements of direct democracy. So we are integrating, for instance, um, um, citizen initiatives, participatory budgeting, referendum, into the, all the tools that we have at our disposal to engage citizens. And then it is a hybrid between um, digital democracy, which has to have very strong rules, for, in particular, I, I, I'm going to stop. No, no, no. Uh, a lot of rules, in particular, about democratic governance of platforms, and in particular, around data. I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about that. I believe data sovereignty is a fundamental political issue for the future. Um, and then this is, has to be a hybrid between digital democracy and participation, real participation in the neighborhoods where people are with diversity, different social economic backgrounds, uh, gender, different ethnic backgrounds, and try to be inclusive in the way we practice democracy. And I think this new participatory democracy should be the alternative to the rise of right-wing nationalism. Fantastic. There's a lot there that I want to come back to. Um, we might want to come back to 
this question of whether direct, direct, more direct democracy is part of the problem or the solution. I think in this country, against the background of Brexit, some people might say that it's the introduction of elements of direct democracy that has, to some extent, undermined um, the, the normal representative uh, democratic system. But let me push you on, on, on the role of technology specifically. Um, are you suggesting that technology is kind of neutral, um, that it can play a positive or a negative role in democracy, uh, and if so, depending on what, what does it depend on? No, it is um, no, it is not neutral. I'm suggesting the opposite. Okay. I'm saying that, in particular, if we look at the immense power that the technology firms have today, uh, obviously we we cannot say it is uh, neutral. I mean, we have to say that it is not neutral, and it should be shaped according to the rules and to the type of uh, political and social system that we want. So, for instance, competition, antitrust, taxation, rules around data sovereignty data access, transparency, all of that should be part of a framework, which I think in this respect, although the narrative is very much, we have the digital supremacy divided into two camps, the US Silicon Valley here and the Chinese, the rise of the Chinese champions here, I do think that Europe is the only place where we're putting forward the different framework for the digital society that's uh, people-centric and rights-based. And I hope, and I have trust, or at least, you know, with a lot of difficulties, maybe, I mean, this, this is where we need a conversation, that we can shape this forward. And let me also say one thing about participatory democracy. I absolutely don't think that participatory democracy and civic engagement can happen using commercial platforms that are designed and they have at the core of their business model the manipulation and commercial exploitation of personal information and data. I think this is a problem, it is a very big problem, and I think we need alternative, also digital infrastructures for political participation that are more decentralized, privacy enhancing, and protect people, people fundamental rights. Right, I mean, this uh, brings to mind the new Shoshana Zuboff book on surveillance mm -hmm. capitalism, which I think everybody is talking about and seems to be very much the structuring the discussion at the moment. But, but let me just again just push you. Um, so are you suggesting, you know, technology is, itself is not the problem, the problem is a concentration of power, that, tech, that, that power is concentrated, that the technology is being used for commercial purposes and in particular concentrated in the, in the hands of big tech companies. Is that the problem? Well, this is a big problem. Okay. I mean, I'm going to be interested to hear John, who's our one big tech representative <laughs> on the panel here, on that. Um, before I come to you, though, John, um, Yulia, you use technology in a completely different way for a party, the Pirate Party, that has been at the forefront of sort of innovating, using technology as part of a, uh, as part of a, in a way, some of the similar things that you were talking about in terms of participatory democracy, but at level of parties. Um, how does this look to you? And maybe you could also say something about the role, which again, Francesca has touched on, of the role of the EU um, right. in this. Yes, uh, thanks a lot uh, for having me uh, participate in this discussion. And obviously, I'm somewhat biased as a representative of a party that has the goal of using technology for the empowerment of the people. So uh, in, that say, in that sense, we kind of naturally take an optimistic stance uh, towards technology, but we also uh, recognize that technology is not going to automatically enhance democracy because it is not neutral and it needs to be uh, shaped and governed. Um, and I think what is perhaps forgotten in this rather pessimistic debate that we're having at the moment, which is focusing very much on how uh, technology or the internet in particular might be uh, abused by certain groups to undermine democracy is that uh, the positive elements that are reinvigorating democracy that we are seeing at the moment are also using the internet. So in Europe you have uh, the students protest uh, against climate change that are springing up in cities uh, all over the continent uh, that are of course using the internet for mobilization, for uh, organizing. In the United States you have Black Lives Matter, you have the Parkland students, and all of these uh, social movements are using the internet as a vital tool for organization and participation. And so um, I would perhaps put a caveat to the statement that this cannot happen at all on commercial platforms. I mean, it is happening, but I think it's very important that we do not uh, put uh, the possibility or the power to uh, give this public space in solely into the hands of companies because the state 
uh, has to be able to provide uh, an, arena, uh, an arena for democracy and for um, uh, new uh, uh, social movements to emerge and uh, to participate in the democratic process. So I, I think, in a way, <laughs> saying that dem democracy could uh, uh, be destroyed by technology is, is perhaps a bit uh, the wrong angle. I mean, the first question we're going to have to ask ourselves is, is democracy going to prevail? And there I, I think this is basically up to us. And whether we manage to, um, to preserve democracy uh, or not, I think either way, technology is going to play a hugely important uh, role in it because it is changing every aspect of our society in the same way that uh, the steam engine uh, did um, a while ago. I think um, when we are talking about um, elements of direct democracy, I would like to perhaps uh, add uh, to the example of Brexit that here we are talking about a referendum where laws were actually broken. So I think sometimes we have already laws in place that just need to be enforced in order to um, address some of the, the possibly negative elements uh, that we're seeing. And um, this is, I think, the case uh, in other areas as well when we're talking about uh, competition, data protection, where we do have legislation in place uh, in some cases that is not being enforced. Um, in the areas where, where it would be important. Um, now, you asked me specifically about uh, the EU's role. Um, I mean, I do believe that regulating technology is necessary in order to make sure that it benefits the people. It can be something very basic like net neutrality. If you don't regulate that, you're not going to preserve the internet as an open space. Data protection is also part of that. But increasingly, we are seeing in the policy uh, processes in Brussels that they are very strongly captured by commercial interests. And those are not solely the interests of technology companies. Certainly, they play a big role as well. But you have uh, the huge political power of uh, telecommunications companies that are uh, very strong and large within Europe, companies like Telefonica, Deutsche Telekom, uh, but also large media companies that don't necessarily like this technological development very much because it has um, spread uh, the power over public opinion, um, a power that uh, before was more concentrated in the hands of traditional media companies, and they're not necessarily happy with this change. So I think primarily digital technology is a change accelerator and that is uh, challenging democracy and traditional democratic institutions because they have to become more agile, more accountable, and this is not necessarily what is happening in the EU decision-making process around technology at the moment. That's, okay, that's very interesting. So I want to come back to the EU in a minute, but, but just let me go back to this, this um, question of the neutrality of, of the technology or otherwise, because um, I do think this is important. Um, you, you pointed out, you know, there are some social movements that we on the panel might see as being much more positive, um, you know, than some others that are also using the same technological tools to mobilize and so on. Um, which again sort of suggests that the tools themselves are kind of politically neutral as it were. It's just a question of, you know, whether you sympathize with Black Lives Matter or the Tea Party, you know. But, but then other people argue that there is something inherent about the technology, particularly social media, that is corrosive of democracy, that it's, that it's producing certain kinds of emotive kind of politics that are actually very, very dangerous in and of themselves. The, the technology is not neutral as such, but it's neither good nor bad taken for itself, which I think is a different thing than okay. to say that it's neutral. But um, I think nevertheless, there are also some uh, themes that are, uh, you know, talked about in, in uh, how social media are changing society that are not necessarily true. For example, this idea of a filter bubble that using social media reinforces messages that um, you already believe in, there is very little uh, academic evidence to actually back that up. By and large, people are more well informed about what's going on uh, in the world than they were perhaps 20 years ago. Um, I think where you do have a problem is where increasingly the information you access uh, online uh, the line between information and advertising is being blurred. And that's, I think, a much bigger problem, especially in a democratic uh, space. Like, um, I think, of course, 
political parties are going to use advertising to a certain extent, but should we allow it that the same political party is uh, allowed to essentially send completely different and contradictory messages to different parts of the population, not based on what the party actually stands for, but based on what they think I want to hear. Um, because I think political parties should not be enterprises that try to trick people into voting for them, but they should primarily uh, be representing an, an ideological uh, ideology or a political idea and should be transparent about communicating that to the outside. And if we don't regulate uh, targeted advertising, I think that might be a problem for democracy right. because it allows parties to tell everybody exactly what they think they want to hear. So if regulation is the solution to this, um, and, you know, the EU has taken a fairly aggressive approach um, in terms of regulating the internet. You've pointed out the, um, the, 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 the dangers there of, of, of the way that regulation works being informed by commercial interests rather than the public interest. Um, but is there not also a danger that what this does is it leads to a kind of a fragmentation uh, of the internet? And Wendy Hall, who's one of our other members of our commission, has, has a paper wrote to you recently about the, the four internets that are emerging, and the European internet is one of them. Is there not a danger that the, the free flow of data is, is kind of hindered by this attempt by the EU to regulate the internet and social media in particular? I think there is a danger um, of uh, fragmentation of the internet, but that's not necessarily happening because of the EU. I think it's happening because of a lot of developments that you see all over the world. And um, I mean, in some cases, I think the regulation that is coming out of the EU is also trying to set global standards rather than trying to uh, shield themselves off from the rest of the world. I think we rather have a problem with the quality of legislation on uh, technological topics where basically this huge corporate power over the decision making process means that academic evidence is not being listened to when we pass legislation. And we, we have a lot of uh, legislative proposals on the table around technology that would actually make the problem worse. Yeah, interesting to see John nodding a lot here. Um, um, <laughs> We come now to our sort of two tech industry representatives that were. Guillaume, a minute ago when we were talking, you said you're not big tech, but you're growing tech. Um, you worked on the Obama campaign um, and then applied, as I understand it, some of the techniques that the Obama campaign used to the Macron campaign. Um, what's your take on, on this whole question of the relationship between democracy and technology? So you're very kind. You didn't mention my role in the Hollande campaign, which I've done before. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind, I'll just give a bit more context about uh, who I am, and that may explain the position I'm going to take about the role of technology and its impact on democracy. So um, I'm a tech entrepreneur. I'm the CEO of LMP. Um, and what we do, our work, is to use data and technology to solve a big problem, which is understand what people really think and then try to change their mind. So we do that for political parties and corporation. Just to give you an example, we have a lot of uh, infrastructure clients and when you build a bridge, an airport, a road, a wind farm, then you need to make sure that the population will accept the project locally. Otherwise, people will oppose and demonstrate, not only in France. Um, <laughs> so you need to understand what people think locally and then you need to understand how you're going to convince them of the benefits of the project. So that's what we do with corporations. But we also work for political parties, uh, as Hans mentioned. By the way, um, I, I completely forgot to thank you for having me here today. <laughs> French people, so impolite. <laughs> uh, um, so thank you very much. Um, um, so I, I said, yes, we did work for uh, political parties. And our technology has been used by a bit more now than 1,000 campaigns in six European countries and the Philippines. Uh, and sometimes people who work with us become French presidents. It does happen. But more often, they lose the election. They gain votes, but they lose the election. Or they become mayors, MPs, um, or you know, local elected officials. So um, what, what does it mean uh, when I said that we use data and technology to convince people? So it means two things. First of all, if you want to convince people, you have to know what they think. You have to capture public opinion. And that's super difficult because I like the image of public opinion as an iceberg. You know, It's very easy to know what people at the tip of the iceberg think, but the silent majority is below the water. And you have to understand what the silent majority think, otherwise you know, things like the gilet jaune crisis uh, may, uh, may actually happen. So that's the first part, understanding public opinion as a whole. And the second part is 
making sure that you're going to reach out to them effectively to change their mind. And the best way to do that is to have a face-to-face -face conversation. So a human-to-human -human conversation, face-to-face. -face. I'm literally talking about what Obama did, then Hollande, then Macron, which is you send millions, or you know, in the case of France, thousands of people knocking at doors to engage with voters. That's the best way to change people's mind. And that's when technology becomes interesting because you can scale up a campaign with a technology, but you still need you know, human beings to have those, uh, those conversations. Um, and th the reason I'm giving you this context is because I think um, there has been a lot of mis misunderstanding, a lot of fake promises about the power of technology. And you know, to be fair, I'm a tech entrepreneur, so I mean, I should be telling you that, yes, technology has a huge impact, is amazingly powerful, and you press a button and then suddenly millions of voters will support your candidate. Well, that's not that simple, fortunately. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, things said about the impact of technology to influence foreign elections, uh, to empower people, to change people's minds. And um, you know, the problem is that, no, technology is not a magic stick. And I'll give you two personal examples to illustrate that. Um, so one has to do with um, when I became a volunteer for Barack Obama, and the other one is about a recent campaign I ran in France for uh, Emmanuel Macron. So in 2008, um, um, I was um, um, a younger West Wing fan uh, who went to America uh, to study at Harvard. And, um, and I was off, I mean, I, I wanted to join the Obama campaign. The problem is I was French with a super strong French accent, which may still be here today a little bit. Um, uh, and uh, I wanted to join the campaign, but I didn't know anyone in the campaign. And that's when technology made, made it possible for me, a young Frenchman with no connection with the Democratic Party, to join the, join the campaign. So I simply registered on Obama's website, and that connected me to someone who was living in my neighborhood. And that person gave me a call and asked me to join the campaign to knock at doors. And it was an amazing experience, even though I was told not to say I was French, because we went to New Hampshire. And uh, New Hampshire people, uh, they still haven't forgiven French people for not fighting in Iraq with uh, America long time ago, uh, so I was, uh, you know, I knocked the doors pretending I was a Dutch person. Um, <laughs> it, yes, because I'm tall and apparently French accent and Dutch accent in the years of people in New Hampshire look alike, sound alike. <laughs> um, so that's my first experience. Without technology, I would never have been able to join the Obama campaign, never. And my experience was the experience of literally 1.5 million other volunteers. And that's made it possible for Obama and his team to knock at, I think, over 30 million doors. You may have more accurate numbers, but, um, and you know, win the election. So that's my first experience. The other experience is with Macron. Um, so my company has been working with En Marche, uh, but I was involved on a personal level long before Macron started his party to help him, you know, uh, um, launch En Marche, and uh, Macron had an intuition. He thought that France, people, politicians did not understand France. Politicians were only viewing the tip of the iceberg. And Macron wanted to run with a simple message. I want to know what the whole country think, not only people who have access to politicians or people who are influencers, everyone, including people who may not like me, including people who may vote for populist candidates. So what did he do? He said, we have to find a way to break the bubbles, you know, break the political bubbles. And he organized something that was called La Grande Marche. So it translates into the Great Walk, nothing to do with Mao Zedong thing a long time ago. Uh, the Great Walk was simply a door-to-door -door campaign launched one year before the French presidential election, not to convince people to support Macron, but to listen to them. And all the data collected by volunteers were then, were then used to build a diagnostic of the country, but not the diagnostic that you would see from a Parisian perspective, the diagnostic of what the silent majority of French people would say. And if you talk about, if you, if you, if you follow a bit of the news, we had something called the yellow vest crisis. I did leave mine in the cloakroom upstairs. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, and you could say, but Macron, what, what's wrong with him? I mean, if he, if, he, if he knew what French people think, what happened? I, I reread the report that was produced by on this operation. All the cl complaints made by the Gilets Jaunes are in the report, okay? Technology and data and human beings listening to people made it possible to know what, was, you know, what French people were thinking deep inside. 
And then you have another human factor called a candidate becoming president, but I'm not going to comment on this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so but it, it sounds, Guillaume, like your experiences have made you more optimistic about the potential for technology. It, it um, I mean, I think it's like every problem. You know, if you understand it properly, then you can try to address the issues. The problem with technology is that in 2008, when I, before I joined the Obama campaign, everything I was reading about the campaign was that technology was magic, magic that social network would change everything. That just with a simple click, you could reach out to millions of people and change their mind. And, and that's not true. It's a beautiful promise, uh, but it simply doesn't work. It's not that simple. My point is that my experience has been to use technology to organize face-to-face -face conversation. And I believe this should be an, it's an important dimension of politics, you know, to be able to engage face-to-face -face with politicians, notably because we all live in bubbles. So we all live in our own bubble. I live in the you know, my friends are tech entrepreneurs who tend to, who went to great universities. I'm sure you know a lot of uh, uh, European politicians now. Um, uh, you may, I mean, I know, I know you know a lot of Catalan people now. No, my, my jokes aside, my point is we live in bubble and I saw technology as a tool to break those bubble and make it possible for people who have different backgrounds to start talking again to each other. And yes, that makes me optimistic. Okay, so John, um as I say, you were nodding, shaking your head at certain other aspects of it, so I'm curious to get your take in general. Um, but, but, I mean, the... You should have come as a mannequin with no facial expression. <laughs> no, not, not at all. Um, it, it seems to me, though, there, there are these sort of um, two sets of criticisms um, directed at, um, in particular, Google and, and Facebook. Um, it seems to me the first is this kind of whole idea of surveillance capitalism, um, uh, which Shoshana Zuboff has been writing about. And she does argue that this begins with Google, actually, but, but it's particularly a Google and, and Facebook kind of issue. Um, but then secondly, you know, beyond the, the sort of current state of the technology, focusing particularly on social media and the role that that's played in our political discourse and so on, seems to me there's also this worry about the next stage of technological development, particularly around AI. And so Yuval Noah Harari, for example, talking about the way that what this is going to do is essentially um, strip us as human beings of our agency and sort of undermine democracy in an even more radical way. Um, do you think there is, I mean, is there, from your perspective working at Google, is there anything to these criticisms or are they just wrong? Um, well, the, the, of course there's valid criticism, um, and I think that both of the arguments that you've brought up or the critiques that you brought up are merit debate and discussion, and that's why I am also happy to be here to take part For which in this, grateful. this panel. I, I think that the bits that I was particularly nodding along vigorously with my colleagues here is that we have a tendency in society to think that things are either all good or all bad. And I think in our lives, we know through our experience that neither is true, that, that, the, that all things are, virtually nothing is all good or all bad. And so when it comes to technology, I think that the, we're on this pendulum where we started, if you think back 10 or 15 years ago, particular, particularly, and I'm thinking of the Arab Spring, you know, unbelievable role of technology. It's democratizing society. It's bringing down oligarchs and, and tyrants. If it, it, it was, you know, because of Twitter and Facebook that Egypt is changing. Well, th that wasn't true then, nor is it true today that social media is corrupting all democratic processes. We just, I think we need to be more thoughtful. But you accept it's corrupting them in some ways. I, what I accept is that technology is a tool by which actors of all kinds can have an influence. And so people who seek to use technology as a tool, like they have used mass media or direct mail or door knocking or leafleting or phone calls or push polling or a variety of other political campaigning techniques can be used for bad. Do I accept that social media on its own is corrupting democracy? No, I do not accept that. But, sorry, go on. Uh, and I think that, if, if I may, I, I think that with the way that, and, and Google does, is not a social media company. I'm not gonna defend Facebook and Twitter and other social media platforms. That's not fun and it's not my role. Uh, and and I, so I think if you think about what Google does 
and which is about trying to help people find ac get access to information, is technology, in the sense of increasing access to information, good for democracy? I think that not, it may not be universally true, but there is no doubt that increasing voters' access to information should be a good thing. Um, not only because it's expanded citizens' access to information, but because it's also expanded and diversified those who get to broadcast information. And we're no longer intermediated by a small number of actors. There are new voices and new systems of distribution. And I think that, that it's not universally good, but I think that there are very positive things out of that. And, and that really is my fundamental point here, is that technology is not in itself deterministic of its role on democracy. Uh, there, it's inherently a social exercise. We decide for ourselves the role that technology plays in how we access and consume inf information as individuals and as society. So this is, in a sense, what I was driving up with the neutrality point. You're suggesting that the, 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 the platforms, the technology are themselves basically neutral. Bad people can use them in the same way that good people can I, use I them. I want to be very clear. But there's nothing I think, structural about I, I think that there, that there was a distinction made before, which I think is an important one. Is technology itself neutral? Yes. Is the, do individual companies play a role that is necessarily neutral? I don't know. I think that's an interesting question. Okay. And I think that is a separate question so to whether or not technology, it, you know, in its entirety uh, is neutral. And I think in its entirety it is neutral. And we, as businesses, as regulators, as members of society, have a role to play in shaping the way that that technology impacts us. And that brings me in a way to Francesca's point there. I mean, is, is, is the, the sort of bigness of big tech, in other words, the concentration of power, a problem? Do you think that it's a problem that Google and Facebook and others have too much power? Um, no. Uh, I mean, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> <laughs> and, and let me let me ask. Let I'm, me, not, I'm not going to defend Facebook, but do I think that do I think that uh, that we have too much power? Uh, no, I do not think we have too much power. I, and I think that if if we are accused of having too much power, there are existing channels by which those complaints are brought. We see that happening all the time. Google is currently uh, you know working very closely with the. Uh, competition authorities in Brussels on a number of matters. <laughs> so, uh, you know, is the like, you know, these are, like, these are important questions. Uh, do, do, do you think that tech, specifically big tech, needs to be regulated more strongly than it has been thus far? I think that we are open to the discussion about the role that regulation can play. I think when it comes to these issues, and I have been very closely involved in the formation of the EU Code of Practice on Disinformation, that w we have to be very thoughtful about where regulation itself can play a role. Because when it comes to disinformation, we are largely talking about legal content. And I think it is a, I, I, might, I don't pose this challenge to say, don't try. But I think it is a serious challenge for regulators at any, in any jurisdiction to regulate the access to content which is legal. And I think that we all should be nervous about, the, about asking regulators to play a role as a ministry of truth. At the, in the same way, we should be nervous about asking technology companies to play that role. Do you think that there is a clash coming, and then I'll open to the audience, um, do you think there is a clash coming between the sort of American version of an open internet where freedom of speech is very much the foundational basis of it versus a European internet where privacy concerns and other concerns um, are much more, um, much more central? Um, so first of all, I don't think that's new, that there's a difference in values. I don't think, I think that difference in values is sometimes over, um, Exaggerated. Oh, exaggerated, thank you. And, uh, and I think that uh, there's no doubt that the European uh, Union has been a step ahead, but I don't think that the status quo in America is going to remain in the short to medium term anyway. OK, great. I don't, unless any of you want to jump in here briefly. Comment. I had a couple. Go, go, go ahead, Francesca. 
Um, well, my, my first comment is in all this conversation, we kept defining technology. We talk about technology yes. Yes. as something, you know, technology, the internet, very abstract, yes. what it is, a bunch of protocols, a bunch of infrastructure is very vague. Yes. So I think that the problem and what we're trying to discuss here is that it's not just a tool. I mean, it's, it's a, a three trillion dollar industry in terms of evaluation and the concentration, the market power and the concentration of power there is extreme. I mean, we probably have seven companies in the planet and I'm being generous here. I mean, four from the US and the rest from China, and which from are Europe. and none from Europe, by the way. So I hope the UK, you guys still feel part of Europe, um, <laughs> that basically are going to dominate um, uh, you know, the, the future of our uh, industry and also shaping, you know, power immensely. And I'm talking about artificial intelligence, but also data, uh, mass scale computation and infrastructures which are fundamental for, you know, our economy, our industry and our society. So I think that's where we have a problem and we should discuss it. But anyways, the data, these, these are the data. And, and I think actually you talk about Europe being strongly regulating and I think is gently, very gentle into kind of proposing a framework which are, which are laws, by the way. And in this I defend the approach of uh, law-based regulation. So if you don't have laws, you, can, you cannot enforce these laws. So when it comes to antitrust and competition, I think it's important to rethink antitrust in the, in the digital era. It is important to enforce taxation because why tech companies don't have to pay taxes as everybody else. And I think when it comes to data protection, privacy, encryption, and our sovereignty over our self-determination, self-information that Termination, I think it's a very solid framework that we have in Europe with laws that enforce that. So I think um, basically we have to... Go further. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on one point. I do think that Google has too much power, sorry, but uh, I also think that so does Volkswagen, so does Reed Elsevier, so does Telefonica or Heckler & Koch or Axel Springer. But I think we seem to be more concerned about it if it's an American tech company than if it's a European kind of traditional industry company. But isn't it also partly because in a sense they're kind of like utilities, aren't they? I mean platforms are a little bit like utilities. Yeah, but so is internet access and there you basically have two or three companies that are dominating the market in Europe and that have immense power over yeah. policy making. Yeah. So but there are rules um, which are a bit more clear. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that quite often you do need to regulate. I just think that we should be careful not to uh, fall into a, a trap where we are mistaking criticism of capitalism with criticism yes. of technology. Yes. Mm. Well, and what's interesting, though, about mm -hmm. this Shoshana Zuboff book is that she brings the two together yeah. in a sense. OK, let's take some questions and comments. The lady there at the back is in the back row. Yes. And if you could say who you, sorry, this lady here in front, yeah. Um, if you could say who you are, and not just a Chatham House affiliation, and um, speak into the microphone. Thank right. you. Lucy Blythe, member of Chatham House. I was intrigued by Francesca's <laughs> comment. Sorry, I that run a consultancy <laughs> called Philia International. Thank you. Um, intrigued by Francesca's comment about starting with cities, because um, on most continents, and we've seen the evidence of it in the US, Europe, and Africa, um, there seems to be greater demand for democracy in cities. And the real challenge is in outside the cities. So I'm, my question for the panel at large is, what can we do to um, help the areas outside cities have more access and engagement? That's interesting, because it does go to this urban-rural divide that actually plays a role in the whole populism debate. Um, let's take a couple more, and then we'll come back to you. The gentleman uh, here in front, yeah. Sorry, behind, behind you, Ludi. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name's Alex Folks, and as well as being a Chatham House member, I'm an election observer on behalf of the EU and OSCE. Uh, one of the things that we see all the time is the, uh, the impact that online campaigning and especially social media have uh, on election campaigns. And it's different in every country in the world. Can't generalize too much, but there is that impact. My concern is that John does not represent Facebook, of course, but, um, but Facebook, 
Facebook in particular are now deigning to allow some sort of monitoring of what they what is done via their platform. Um, but it is in their gift to allow that to happen. And one of the concerns I have is that the uh, the laws of the country, and each country has different laws, some are better, some are worse, but we aren't seeing the technology companies uh, acceding to the laws of the country. What they do, they're doing is trying to create a, a globalized, we will give you this type aspect to it. And I just wonder whether you, the panel felt that uh, there can be more insistence that when it comes to things like elections, the tech companies play by the, the national laws uh, rather than their own perceived uh, what, we're perce what we're willing to give. Okay, and then maybe the gentleman right at the front, in, just in front of you, yeah. Thank you, John Warren, physician and member. Of course, commerce and politics are in the same game. They're in the market to get power. Um, they're using campaigns and advertising, politics to get the vote, and uh, commerce to get the money. So uh, it's not surprising that they overlap. Isn't the main problem, though, a matter of rate of change? So that commerce, uh, so, so technology has moved so quickly, law and regulation have moved slowly, and enforcement have moved really slowly. Right. So urban, rural, um, tech companies and the law, and, and I might add to that this idea that goes back to Lawrence Lessig, I think, that code is law, that actually by, you know, that, that law is increasingly being embedded in code, and so the tech companies are in a sense creating laws. Um, maybe that's for you, John. Um, and then this question about the rate of change and, and can we keep up. Um, do you want to go first, John? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm happy to answer the, the question about uh, the national and global approach. So, I, I, from our experience, so we, um, so first of all, we have signed a code of practice with the European Commission, which uh, includes rules around and principles around advertising uh, and political advertising, election advertising. And it applies to national elections and referendum in all EU member states. And our commitment, because we made it in October, applies here in the UK as well. That creates a standard of uh, tech companies needing to uh, include information basically in ad disclosure. So who's behind this advertisement? Uh, uh, verification of their identity and uh, a creative repository of transparency report uh, so that you can see all the ads that were run um, and the money that was spent on them, absolutely. And, and some basic targeting criteria that is GDPR compliant. Um, and that's a commitment that we uh, have made. You can see what we did in the US during the midterm elections last year as an example of what we have announced and are rolling out ahead of the parliamentary elections that take place in Europe this coming May. I, I think from a, to understand why there are sometimes gaps in this sense between what national law calls for and what technology companies are doing is that in this case, national law is not caught up. So it's not that we are going above the law. Most, there, are, there is not a single EU country which has introduced clear regulation of digital advertising for elections. It just doesn't exist. And there are not rules, or there, excuse me, there is not consistency in the rules in terms of who's allowed to fund elections. So there are some countries in Europe where they very clearly and transparently, political parties get their money from foreign countries. There are numerous examples of that across the continent. So we're put in a place where there is political and public pressure, which I, is legitimate, for us to make sure that there's not foreign intervention in elections and that we are providing a level of disclosure. And then we look at at the same time, our commitments to being adherent to the law in every country in which we operate, and it then becomes very difficult to build a scalable solution. So what we have, the approach we have taken is to go beyond the law in EU countries and to set a higher standard for what our, our, how our systems will operate, because otherwise, not only are we building a system for 27 countries at once, but we would have to build a system that had many different layers of enforcement and different rules because of the patchwork of this legislation. So our approach is as I've described it, and I actually think it goes, it's, it, 
I, I would think it is pro-democracy because we are going to force more disclosure than member states would have required us to otherwise. Okay, Julia. Yeah, I, I do think we need more rules uh, on, around elections, but the question is what kind of rules? I mean, um, and what we have seen with this, with this kind of co-regulation approach, which is basically the, the European Commission is making the threat of passing legislation unless the companies somehow fix it themselves. And uh, the fixes that they come up with are not always really fit for purpose. So for example, with uh, Facebook, you have this uh, archive of election uh, advertisement where you can look at what kind of advertisement has been placed but uh, it is actually making it extremely difficult for independent researchers from universities to use the data the way that they see fit and run the analysis that they think are most relevant. And I think there we have to be really careful and I, I would rather say that there should be uh, mandated transparency and access to the raw data on these kinds of things. Um, I think there is also sometimes a little bit of a hubris that um, uh, technology companies are not always aware of the specificities of particular elections. So for example, like there was a lot of experience that was gained uh, from the UK referendum and also from the Irish referendum about uh, some of the problems and pitfalls. And there is a lot of focus on the topic of foreign interference at the moment, um, which is you know, possibly part of the problem, but certainly not uh, the whole problem. And then sometimes companies try to just apply those rules to a new context. So uh, Facebook recently announced that uh, they want to basically apply the same rules that they have tested in the UK context to the EU elections, which include that uh, an entity can only place advertisement in their own country, which is, you know, when you think about it, so we have the European Parliament uh, uh, placing advertisement around the election, asking people to vote. That would only be shown in Belgium, I suppose. I mean, that doesn't really make sense. So um, I think what I would really like to see is that if companies have policies around that, that they build them together with the electoral authorities, because they are the ones who are responsible for running the elections. And I, you know, if they talk to them from the start, probably these kinds of mistakes would not happen. Um, on the code is law point, I think uh, we have a little bit of a, a, a problem where politicians have a um, contradictory view of technology. On the one hand, they think that uh, you know these technology companies are the devil and they uh, can do. Uh, you know, algorithms are kind of scary and uh, they will destroy all our jobs and the singularity is just around the corner and so on. So on the, on the one hand, there's kind of an, inflation, an inflated uh, uh, belief of what technology can do and it's, uh, they find it extremely scary. But yeah, at the same time, there's kind of a childlike trust into it where we are passing legislation that is asking technology companies to solve extremely different, uh, difficult societal issues. I mean, there I agree on the fake news point that uh, you're not gonna build an algorithm that can distinguish uh, misinformation from legitimate news. It's, it's not possible. And um, I think some of the attempts in this area are actually changing our political norms. Um, yeah, and just a, a final comment uh, on, on the point about urban and rural that was raised at the beginning. I think whenever we do use uh, technology to try to enhance democracy, we have to be very careful about the digital divide and that not everybody has the same access to technology. And you, if you focus on that too much, you might actually end up disenfranchising communities that are already somewhat cut off from the decision-making yeah. process. Did you, yeah. either of you want to add anything on that? Yeah, maybe I can expand on the point around the divides. I think there are many divides. Uh, there is a geographical divide, and I think we also see it played pretty strongly in France nowadays, you know, what the countryside versus the city, and cities more and more um, kind of centralizing a lot of the economic um, power, but also all the problems around that. Uh, there is socio-economic divides and gender divides uh, within even cities and then beyond cities. And so, for instance, when we do our technology policy at the city level, we try to address all of that. I mean, first with the kind of connectivity divide. So, for instance, Barcelona is a city that owns its own broadband. We have 700 <laughs> square meters of broadband, which is public fiber. And we, we share it also with smaller vi villages in Catalonia, and we have a policy 
policy of neutral and fair access to this broadband. Uh, but we also do a lot regarding education and digital skills and empowerment and digital democracy as part of the question around digital divide. Because I think connectivity is one part, but it's much, it's much uh, bigger than that. And so, you know, we are training uh, kids, we are integrating in the curriculum of school uh, questions around technology, 3D printing, but also science, technology, and the arts, so STEAM education and pedagogy around technology. So is, 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 I think the divide is a broader uh, issue. I wanted to say also something around this question of speed yes. that was posed yes. between technology is so fast and regulation is so slow. I think this is partially true, but you should see the short term and the long term. So I think uh, something can be disrupting and very fast, you know, disrupting. Some things are good to be disrupted, other things not because we don't have alternatives that are robust, that are egalitarian, and that are societal uh, alternatives. When it comes to healthcare, education, public transportation, it's not just enough to disrupt it. You also want to see what is a better model to handle this kind of co complex societal problems. And I think sometimes regulation may seem too slow, or politics may seem too slow, but actually we do have the instrument, and we could be much more longer term and visionary. So I think we lack a little bit of ambition. So if you see at how we got to this technological development, this was because mostly the state has been investing a lot of resources, has been funding university research centers, talent, and industry. And industries were able to then speed up and you know all this technological development. But in the first place, there was a vision where we want to go. There was a lot of public investment, and society was working to achieve certain objectives. And some, somehow it feels also to me that we are a bit, I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't have the conversation around what do we do in the next elections and how do we fix the problem, how do we regulate Google. These are all great, but I think we also have to be more ambitious. We have to look at the long term. What kind of alternatives do we want? I mean, do we want, for instance, I mean, I keep saying that I do not want to rely only on commercial big platforms based in the US or based in China, you know, we can see the difference. I do not only want to rely on these big commercial platforms for civic and democratic participation. I think we have alternatives, like for instance in Barcelona, Europe could scale these alternatives very quickly. We have a, a platform which is decentralized, it's privacy enhancing, it's open source, it has ethics, privacy and security by design. We actually do private impact assessment on the algorithm and the platform is owned by the citizens themselves not by governments and not by the corporations. The citizen own the platform, it is a digital common, and in particular, they own the data, so that there cannot be this kind of manipulation. And I think this is more transparent, is more accountable democratically, and this decentralized infrastructure can become a pan-European and then maybe even beyond, because we have <laughs> other cities globally that are taking it up. So it's more maybe a grassroots, it's a bottom-up approach that has a, a bigger vision. So, so we, we want actually to change things as well. We can. A, citizen, <laughs> a citizen's owned search engine. Uh, no, well, well, hold on. Well, I think indexing can be a public good if that's the question. And I think we did have a lot of capacity in Europe. I mean, you know, from CERN, big universities, the Minitel, uh, what about that? Well, we have a lot of scientific and technological capacity, and I think we can still be leaders in this world and not just uh, uh, digital colonialism. You know, in Europe, we want to be leading this technological revolution and also match our standards, which are environmental, gender, uh, social, and citizen rights standards. Yeah. Guillaume, um, on the urban rural thing, I mean, the Gilets Jean, at mm -hmm. least at the beginning, were people who'd been pushed out of the cities because of ri rising real estate prices and then were hit by the fuel tax increase and, 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 and were therefore protesting, right? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Yeah. So I think it's important. For me, the rural versus urban has to do with how do you understand everyone, that, you know, the silent majority. And the Gilets Jaunes is exactly a crisis of the silent majority not having the connection with the political world to share the issues. And, um, and it's very important to be able to uh, uh, listen to people even after election day. You know, I mean, if you know politicians, if you've been on a campaign, you know that during a campaign you try to have a lot of contact with voters, but then you're elected or not, and it stops. Uh, it shouldn't stop. And for a very good reason, because if you don't 
listen to people continuously, you made bad policy decisions. And I'll give you one example. Um, um, my, my company has been working with a, a German-based based think tank, Das Progressive Zentrum, who was interested in understanding what people were living in areas affected by the migrant crisis, what they thought of politics, and you know what they thought of populist parties, etc. So what we do, and when we we send um, we send we send people uh, in targeted neighborhoods uh, to knock at doors and ask a series of questions in Germany and in France. In France, it was in Calais. You know, Calais, it's uh, very completely affected by the migrant crisis. In Germany, it was in a bunch of places, but they had in common uh, to have uh, migrant centers nearby. And um, you know, so you could say, and most politicians today think that immigration is a big problem, and they have to be tough on immigration, no matter if they used to have a more progressive discourse on immigration. So what comes out of those conversations? that immigration is never mentioned as a top issue per se, never. The, what, what the migrant crisis show is that people suddenly realize that the government is doing something for migrants, but they're like, but you've not, you're not doing anything for me, and that's the core problem. So if you start being tough on, on immigration, maybe on the short run, I'm not saying you won't have an impact on the short run, but you're not solving the core problem. So, Bottom line, if you don't continue to listen to people afterwards, you will make bad policy decisions because you don't know what they think. And you know, it comes back to the distrust with institution. That was the main problem that we uh, identified through this. And if I may, someone had a made a comment about uh, online campaigns and whether they should be regulated. So in France, to be, uh, it's completely forbidden to pay a political ad during an official campaign period. Completely forbidden. Uh, Okay, we still are able to win elections. Um, uh, no, but I want to say something uh, which has, I mean, I'm not a regulator, uh, so I'm not an expert, but I think if when you want to regulate something, you have to be certain about its impact. So you have to be able to measure its impact. Otherwise, you may regulate things that need not be regulated. And online campaigns, there's a, a lot of scientific literatures, literature on the impact of different campaign techniques on, on the vote, and uh, the, the two uh, scientists behind that are Alan Gerber and Donald Green. They publish a book every year called Get Out the Vote. I recommend you read it. It's a summary of all scientific experiments run on campaigns. What does it show regarding online campaigns? No impact. There has not been a single scientific experiment that show that you can win votes using online campaigns. It's very spectacular. It's great for journalists because it makes amazing stories, but it does not have an impact. So my view on the, German, on the Russian intervention in, in, in the US, very spectacular, yeah. no impact. Yeah, very, very interesting. Um, we, let's squeeze in a couple more questions. Um, at the front here, two at the front here, yeah. Tricia and then Asta. Hi, Tricia de Borgra, freelance writer. Um, I just wanted to take up your point on if technology is going to facilitate, enable that representational element, that bottom-up um, element, do we really have to start looking at what the electoral uh, political systems are in each country? Because a Macron could happen, happened in France, but it couldn't happen in England because of its electoral. So do we need to have more of a coalescing of that if we're going to really think about bottom-up We've got to think of, you know, top-down political uh, institutions and systems. Very interesting. One of the things we're going to be looking at in the commission, um, Asta behind, right behind, yeah. Um, my name is Asta Guðrun Helgadóttir, and I'm a student at the Oxford Internet Institute. Um, the internet is very much an American invention. Google is an American invention. Facebook is an American invention. The internet itself is basically an American invention. And I've heard uh, Francesca Bria especially talk about like right-based approach when we are talking about technology. Are we maybe facing, like, is the question that we should be asking maybe more, does Europe agree with the internet? Hmm. Does Europe <laughs> disagree with how the internet has been structured and how it functions? And is maybe that part of the question that we are basically trying to answer today? Great, and then right at the front here. And that goes to what I was suggesting earlier about the, the possible fragmentation uh, of, of the internet. Yes, you, sorry, you're waiting patiently. Hi, uh, Martin Plout, Institute of Commonwealth Studies. I'm just worried that this, this discussion is very northern, uh, northern in the sense that the, you know, people in Africa, for example, where are we? Um, and you know, uh, John talks about the idea of having a, a nice little arrangement with Europe. Great, very pleased about it. 
but where are we in Africa? Look at somewhere like, like Bell Pottinger, which brought South Africa close to the edge of civil war through the Guptas and what Zuma did and what he, they paid for. This was exceptionally dangerous. If it wasn't for old-fashioned journalists who called them out, it, the results could have been absolutely catastrophic. And South Africa is not alone. You see similar things in Kenya. And you know, you guys are going to have nice arrangements in Europe. What about the rest of the world, where already democracies are weak and uh, systems of regulation are extremely lacking? OK, great. I'm really sorry we don't have more time to, to, um, to have more questions. Um, so we have a few minutes left, so maybe you could pick one of those three questions and make any last uh, comments you want to make. So electoral systems, um, the global south, um, and is Europe against the internet? Um, John, do you want to start? I mean, maybe the Global South one, I feel, was most directed at you. Yeah, so uh, I think it's a fair critique. I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that we aren't working on these issues. We have big elections coming up this year in South Africa and Nigeria, and we have teams introducing a lot of the same tools that we're introducing in Europe and North America there. The, the, we're, uh, we're not doing as much on political advertising. Also, there's not as much political advertising in those markets. Um, and so it's not, it's, not a abject, or it's not a giving up our responsibility there, but the, some of the tools that we're developing are more specific to the needs on the ground. Uh, I have a team that's in uh, Pretoria this week doing training for political parties about using to online tools to help people f uh, to be able to spread authoritative content and to fight disinformation. And we had a very uh, a wide uh, a range of tools that we uh, use in Kenya to, to try to ensure that the post-election violence we had seen in the previous election didn't reoccur, at least not because of using our tools. So I think it's a good critique. I don't want you to leave the impression that we're not thinking about it or that we're not working on it, because we are. Great. Guillaume, electoral systems, do they matter? Yeah, so you, you, you said that uh, Macron happened in France, but it couldn't happen anywhere. I think Macron could happen anywhere, but don't forget that Macron was extremely lucky in France. Um, in the sense that, and that's a very important lesson. Uh, when, you know, it's very easy f when you win an election to say that you did everything right and then you won. It's not true. I mean, sometimes you run amazing campaigns and you lose, and sometimes you run very poorly organized campaign and you win. And Donald Trump is an example. His, campaign, his campaigns was poorly organized in the way it used data, in the way it mobilized volunteers. It was really poorly organized compared to Hillary Clinton, who inherited uh, Barack Obama's infrastructure. Um, so today we can measure what works and what doesn't work. And again, maybe I should not be saying that, but if someone tells you that he has the magic, magic recipe to m help a candidate win 10, 15, 20 percentage point, it's a lie. It's simply a lie. We know today, because there's been a lot of experiment and measurement, when you do a campaign, you can move the needle by three to five percentage point max. So what happened with Macron? I think it's a combination of there was an opening in the center, which Macron did not control. He didn't control who was the Socialist Party candidate, did not control who was the right-wing party candidate, but they were both, they went to their extremes. Uh, there was a, a spot in the center. Then the main uh, candidate collapsed because of a scandal. Macron had nothing to do with that. I mean, if you've heard something contrary, it's not true. He had nothing to do with that. What did he do? He focused on what he could control, which is organizing his campaign, mobilizing volunteers, knocking at doors, building a movement that he could control. And then he got a bit lucky, as Mark Zuckerberg got lucky when he made Facebook, as your you know, bosses got lucky when they made Google. There were probably like 10 other Googles that never emerged. You had to be lucky to achieve great things. I mean, you have to work well, but you also have to be a bit lucky. So my, I don't think, and I've had this debate with people in the UK, actually, uh, about the possibility to start a movement from scratch. Uh, and I don't think the political system is a constraint. I am convinced it is not a constraint. Ma what did Macron? He raised money because he had no money. He raised money more than anyone before. It's hard to raise money, but you can do it. Then he mobilized people. It's hard to convince people to give time for you, but it is possible. And then, you know, he was, he was in a way lucky. This could happen in other countries, I believe. Okay, Julia, any final thoughts? Yeah, uh, does Europe agree with the internet? I think it's very much a generational question, and Europe is, for 
the most part run by 60 year old men and they certainly do not agree with the internet and uh, I think Douglas Adams said that uh, it, technology that is around when you're born is normal technology that comes when you're 20 is the best thing ever and it's going to revolutionize the world and the technology that comes when you're 40 is evil and will destroy democracy apparently um, so I think basically the people under 20 in Europe uh, probably would not want to live without the internet and they have a completely different political discourse from uh, the one that most of you have. Like uh, if you ask uh, your, I don't know, 16 to 20 year old children about Article 13, they probably know what I'm talking about and are concerned about it. Um, because they are, yeah, basically looking at the internet as a really important part of their um, of their lives and of society. Um, on the electoral system, yeah, I do think that Macron could happen in the UK. Um, I studied electoral systems uh, uh, at an earlier point, and um, actually, I mean, all the European democracies started out with first past the post. And it was always the party system that diversified first. So it's parties that change electoral laws at the end of the day. And what we have in the UK at the moment is a completely untenable situation. You have a two-party system where on the most important political question of a generation, they are saying the same things. They're just fighting about who is going to be better at Brexit. But. Uh, Eventually, I am sure that unless uh, Brexit somehow magically goes away, uh, there will be a political divide around this question with parties representing both camps. Um, and uh, that will lead to a multi-party system and then you're going to get rid of first past the post. Okay, let's not get into Brexit with one minute to go. Um, Francesca, Absolutely, no. last word. Um, yeah, maybe two things I would like to say. So first of all, I think it's very important that when we discuss democracy and new forms of democracy, we don't only focus on elections. I find it yeah. completely restrictive. Yeah. I think also, I mean, in the last um, like six to eight years, I've been working on participatory democracy throughout the world, and I see a big change in how political parties are engaging members at city level, how we all, like throughout the year, you know, in Barcelona, our policy program has been written with 400,000 citizens actively shaping it, and 70% of the proposals that are our action plan today were proposed directly from citizens. This is really about reshaping the relationship between citizens and governments and you have to have a way to do it and I think this is the way to think about a new form of democracy which by the way is very close to the real <laughs> things that matter to people for me it's very hard to discuss a smart city or a data cryptography with citizens they want to know about affordable housing energy um, you know bills they want to know about mobility they want to know about the question of migration climate change I mean important things and we should be able to show how technology is shaping and influencing yeah. that and that's that's going away from the technocratic agenda uh, to the internet question I think it's very important to move away from cages I think the internet at this point is, a, is, a, is even that is a construct that's not useful for me. So if you think about what is the future internet, you have to think about 5G, artificial intelligence, large-scale computation, decentralized architectures, new protocols are emerging. It's not just the internet, so not at the technological level, but at the discourse level, I think it's very narrow. And I like to believe that um, the rights-based framework, which have fundamental rights at the core and you know, information, self-determination, and data protection, and, and algorithmic accountability can become global standards. So it's not just going to be a splinter net, and especially not just between surveillance capitalism and the Chinese dystopia. I would like to think that we can propose something better for humanity. Wonderful. On that note, I'm really sorry again that we couldn't take more of your questions, but we will be, as I said at the beginning, having many more um, events exploring different aspects of this um, in more depth. Clearly, the next one, we need someone from Facebook on the panel. Um, maybe, we can ask, um, maybe we can ask Nick Clegg to come along. Um, and, um, so about Brexit or Facebook. Exactly. But yeah. I hope we've shown you how, um, uh, how important these issues are, how complex they are, and how brilliant um, our project is going to be with um, these three members of our commission. Um, we hope, as I said at the beginning, that you will get involved. Um, there'll be uh, information about how to do that on our website um, very, very soon. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again for the next event here. Thank you.